So while I was preparing this message, uh, I was trying to think back over my terribly long life of 19 years. And uh, I was trying to think of a time when someone had, had really hurt me or um, a time when somebody had really wronged me um, and just treated me unfairly. But no matter how hard I thought about it, I just couldn't think, I couldn't think of anything that was, you know, a good testimony to share with you guys. But then the Lord revealed something to me, and I was humbled immediately. The Holy Spirit revealed to me this. He said, Michael, I'm not having you share this message because you know what it looks like to forgive someone. He said, I'm having you share this message only because you know what it is like to have to be forgiven so much. These are the words of the Lord, and I mean it when I say this. I have never felt the Holy Spirit so present in the room leading up to this moment. It was almost surreal. I was hearing the Lord so clearly. And, and what I quickly realized is that I sin against the Lord more in one 24-hour day than I will ever be wronged in my entire lifetime. You see, I'm not up here to act like I know what it means to forgive because I'm going to be honest, I struggle with it and that's why I'm talking about it today. But I'm up here because I need you guys to be ready to forgive people like me. I need you guys to know what it looks like to forgive sinners like me. The Lord has put me up here to remind us all of what it looks like to forgive each other just as he has forgiven us. And so I'm going to do my best to just get out of the way and just let the Lord speak through me. So um, I just want you to all know and keep in mind as well that if at any point throughout this message you begin to feel encouraged or you begin to feel like um, the Lord's revealing something you, to you concerning this topic, just know it's not me. It's not my words. It's truly the Lord's words. Um, so be before we get started, I just want to pray. Um, I know that we've already prayed but you can never pray enough. And um, so I just want to pray so that we have our hearts open and willing to listen to him tonight. Father God, ah, you, are, you are so good. And Lord, I thank you for bringing us here tonight um, for such a great purpose. <laughs> no, not to listen to me preach for the first time. And not to, to get together and, and fellowship, even though that is such a blessing, Lord. That's not why we're here. You brought us here for a purpose much greater. Father, I thank you for that. And so tonight, I just pray that you would open me up and just help me get out of the way. And um, just, I pray that I would be a vessel for you, Lord, so that these people can hear the words that you want to share with them tonight. And Father, I pray that you would humble this church. Humble it in ways it's never been humbled before just like you humbled me in that room. Father, I thank you for your abounding grace and your endless love. It's in your name I pray. Amen. So yes, tonight we get to hear a message on forgiveness. Now, you guys need to know something first. Um, when, about a month ago, when the Lord laid it on my heart to talk about forgiveness, um, I had no idea whatsoever that Brad was going through this go deeper message. I never look through the bulletin. I'm bad, I know. Um, but even more so, I didn't know that he was going to be talking about loving your enemies the Sunday before I was to speak. So I kind of freaked out a little bit. I was like, well, dang it, like, I don't want to seem like the guy who's just, you know, saying exactly what the pastor just said Sunday or, um, you know copying his words, and so I started to worry a little bit. But it was funny, because the Lord actually visited me again. And he said, Michael, just calm down. He said, I have my hand in everything. You don't trust me yet? And um, he just told me, like, you know, it's, it's okay. I've timed this for a reason. I wish I could tell you what that reason is, but I can't. Um, maybe it's for emphasis sake. I don't know. But what I do know is this, that we can never hear a message on forgiveness enough. Because it is so crucial to us as followers of Christ. And forgiving our enemies might just be one of the most important parts of our walk with the Lord. And, and yet we seem to forget that all the time. 
Um, so rather than just firing tons of random points and information at you, um, the Lord read, led me to just really keep this message simple and focused on one point. Um, he laid it on my heart to, to rifle in, as Brad would say, um, on the importance of forgiveness and its incredible power. Um, so to do that, I want to just first define what forgiveness means biblically. So in 1692, over 300 years ago, um, a man named Thomas Watson wrote a book called The Body of Divinity. And in his writing, he answers the question, when do we forgive? And he writes this, we forgive others when we strive against all thoughts of revenge, when we will not do our enemies mischief, but wish well to them, grieve at their calamities, pray for them, seek reconciliation with them, and show ourselves ready on all occasions to relieve them. Now, I share this with you because I find Watson's um, response here to be very profound, a very profound definition of what forgiveness is, and it's very biblical. So, beginning with his first point, resist thoughts of revenge. Um, Romans 12, 19 says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Number two, don't seek to do them mischief. 1 Thessalonians, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. You know, so pretty self-explanatory and very biblical. Number three, wish well to them. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those abuse, who abuse you. And those are the words of Jesus in Luke. Um, so it, it seems radical. It's like we're, we're called to do the exact opposite of what our innate nature wants to do. You know, we're... I mean, seriously, like, bless those who curse you? That doesn't make any sense in this world. No, it doesn't, but we're not of this world. We're just in it, you know, and we're called to bless those who curse us. Grieve at their calamities. Um, Proverbs 24, 17. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. So actually, when we see someone doing evil, or when we see someone hating another person, we need to be sad about that you know, that our enemy is being that way, not, not like, oh, yes, he's being, you know, he's being evil, you know, he's going to go to hell. No, like, we need to grieve about that because that's a soul. That's a life. Pray for them. Number five. Um, Matthew five forty four. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And this goes right back to wishing well, um, point number three, um, blessing those who curse us. Number six, seek reconciliation with them. Romans 12, 18 says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, leave, live peaceably with all. And I just want to make the point here that forgiveness is not reconciliation. Um, you know, reconciliation is a long process at times, and it's, it's something that happens over a period of time, and it's the final result. But, you know, forgiveness is actually the first step towards reconciliation. And if we desire reconciliation at all, then it's going to require us to first forgive. Number seven, be always willing to come to the relief. I love this because um, it's actually an example from the Old Testament, Exodus 23, 4. It says, if you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall bring it back to him. And the reason I love it so much is because um, well, it's a great example in the Old Testament. The, all the other examples I gave you were from the New Testament, Jesus. But this is like, it's so radical, but it's so awesome. Like, you know, if you meet your enemy's ox, you know, just take it back to him, you know. So it's just cool. I like it. So again, these seven points I found to be very helpful and very biblical when it comes to really defining what forgiveness means. Um, because for a lot of us, I think, I think we know the general meaning and what forgiveness kind of looks like, but I think we forget what all is truly included um, in forgiving someone. And these seven things really just do a great job of pointing to a forgiving heart. So now that we have a clearer, more biblical understanding of what forgiveness means, um, I want to get deeper. I want us to see just how important it is to forgive your enemy. Um, and in so doing, I think you guys will really... Um, get to see just how powerful this weapon um, called forgiveness truly is. So to start off, I couldn't think of a better place to begin um, than looking at forgiveness in the eyes of Jesus. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that we could all agree 
Um, forgiveness was of the utmost importance to Jesus. Um, I mean, he not only taught us to forgive, but he is the one who demonstrated what ultimate, true, complete forgiveness is. And if he didn't do that, we wouldn't even know what it really looks like. Um, so in Matthew 18, 21 through 22, um, it says, Lord, how often... Oh, this is uh, the parable of the unforgiving servant when Peter comes to Jesus. And he asks him, he said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. And I love this because what we need to see that is that forgiving a brother and a sister is so important to Jesus that he tells Peter, no, not seven times, like 77 times, you know, like a lot, you know. And um, so that's just awesome. And actually on your cards, um, on the back, it says seven times uh, 70, right? Well, I realize I said forgive seven times, not, se or not seven times, but 77 times. So I just want to take a break here and let you guys know um, about the text spe specifically here. Um, because I know there's a lot of questions and debate with like, well, my translation says this, and then the other translation says seven times 70. Um, like, like the ESV or NIV um, says not seven times, but 77 times. And then like the Holman Christian Standard, which is what we're using, um, will say seven times 70. And so here's what I have to say to that. If we're really that worried and spending that much time about the difference between translations like that, we're going to miss the whole point that Jesus is making here. Um, the point is not to forgive someone exactly 77 times or not to forgive someone exactly 490 times. The point he's making here is that we shouldn't keep track whatsoever. Um, and quite honestly, if you were to keep track of how many times um, you were to forgive someone, you'd probably lose count by the time you got to 77. I know I would, let alone 490. Um, so the point we need to dwell on here is that we are called to never stop forgiving our brothers and sisters. Yeah, it's tough. It's hard. I know, because... I'm there too. Um, but what, just think about what Jesus does for us daily. You know? And, and what did he do on the cross for us? You know, forgiving someone can be one of the most challenging things to do in life and as a Christian. But it's necessary for us to do if we're truly going to, the, going to follow the example that Christ has set before us. So as I said, Christ truly demonstrated forgiveness on the cross. In Luke 23, we see Christ on the cross, and that's why I showed this video, because he's breathing his last, but yet saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see, even on the cross, Christ was deeply concerned for the ones who were killing him. Christ was concerned um, about the soldiers who were beating him to death. He was still concerned about their forgiveness and their salvation. Doesn't that just blow your mind? Like, think about that. I mean, we don't even know what that would be like because we've never been hanging on a cross dying. But just think about it. Like, we struggle to forgive someone when they cut us off while we're driving. Have you guys ever, like, have you guys ever experienced that? Like, you get mad, you're like, are you serious? You know, you want to give them the finger, you know what I'm talking about? You know, all right. Not saying I do, but yeah, you do. You want to. And, and, you know, we can't seem to let that go and just like, seriously, it's just, a, you know, he's just cutting over. Um, so that. Um, we struggle to forgive when our waiter at the restaurant gets our order wrong. Am I right? Like, you're so mad. You're like, are you kidding me? Like, I told you this, you know? Um, let's see, what else? We struggle to forgive when someone stands us up. We struggle to forgive when someone talks bad about us behind our back. Um, I mean, you fill in the blank. You can, you can imagine all the things we hold grudges about. And all of these examples define us. We are the unforgiving servants. That parable defines us. It's describing us, the unforgiving servant. Um, and that is why all I can say is that we need to look to the cross. Um, if forgiveness wasn't important, Jesus would not have been concerned about forgiving the guys who were killing him, who were beating him to death. The second thing we need to remember concerning Jesus' perspective on the importance of forgiveness is that Jesus desires reconciliation. Um, 
In Matthew 5, 23-24, Jesus says, So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. So we see here that reconciliation actually takes priority over the offering, which when I read this verse, I was like, are you serious? You know, I thought like giving an offering or a tithe is a, like one of the most important things you can do for the church, you know? And so it, it kind of like, this is weird to me. But, you know, it's still true for us today what it's saying. Yes, the Lord is pleased with our offerings and our tithing. Don't get me wrong. But it means nothing if we're avoiding um, reconciliation with our brothers and sisters. Why bother? Why bother give your offer, to give your offering if you, if you can't forgive your own brother in Christ, your own sister in Christ? And, you know, it's just, it means nothing. Now, again, I want to explain that forgiveness is not reconciliation. However, it is one of the very first steps towards reconciling or mending a broken re- relationship. And therefore, it is of the utmost importance for us to forgive even before we present our offerings to the Lord. So now that we've got a glimpse of just how important forgiveness is in the eyes of Jesus, I want to turn our attention to others and take a look at the importance of forgiveness concerning our brothers and sisters. Um, First and foremost, by forgiving others, they'll be able to see and feel um, the example and love of Christ. And this is huge for believers and even more so for those who don't believe. Others need to see that no matter what, we're going to love them. Because isn't that what Christ does for us? Like no matter what we do, his love never fails. You know, it's it's incredible. Um, So in 2 Corinthians 2, 5 through 8, Paul says, Now, if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me. But in some measure, not to put it too severely... To all of you, for such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. And this verse goes right back to Thomas Watson's definition of forgiveness we looked at. Um, We are to wish well to them, grieve at their calamities, pray for them, and always be willing to come to their relief. You know, Paul really hit it on the head. He's, he's saying that the grief the enemy is receiving from the others is enough. We need to be different. We are called to be the radical ones. We are called to be the ones that love when others would hate. That's what we're called to do. And Paul doesn't just ask him to do this. It says at the end of verse 8, um, so I beg you to reaffirm your He's begging, you know. He's like, this is so important. Um, So yeah, in so doing this, others will just see us differently than the rest of the world. And they'll see the love of Jesus. Um, This idea really goes right along with uh, Romans 12, 20 through 21. And I think Brad had actually touched on this. You know, I'm repeating his message. Um, Sorry. No, but he actually touched on it um, on Sunday. And uh, it's Paul. And he says, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And this is actually one of my favorite verses because it really defines the relationship between God and Satan when you think about it. Like, God is constantly overcoming evil with good. And this this spiritual warfare that happens all around us, I know that we don't see all the time, it's, it's God battling Satan. It's good overcoming evil. And as Christians, he has called us to do the same as we walk beside him. Martin Luther King Jr. actually said something very noteworthy once. He said, um, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Um, so... This, I just love this quote because, you know, again, it, it just reminds us of the only way we can drive out hate is to love. If you're, if you're tired of your enemy hating you, love them. It's, it's simple. I know it's hard, but it's simple. You see, it's hard, but it's simple. It's just radical. So not only that, but by giving grace to others, they will be humbled, and their hearts are likely to soften. Um, you may not believe me, but... 
Someone who does evil to someone usually isn't expecting something, you know, someone to love them in return. And, you know, like, if I slap someone in the face, I don't expect them to just be like, oh, I love you so much, you know. No, it's, it's the exact opposite. They, they don't show love in return. But when and if they do receive love in return, they're suddenly caught off guard, and more than likely they'll start to rethink what they've done, you know, how they mistreated you. It's weird how it works, and again, it seems radical, but that is what being a Christian is about. And, and that is how the Lord works in crazy, radical ways. Um, the second thing we need to keep in mind concerning the interest of others when we forgive is that they are being given another chance. And this is huge because this is really what forgiveness is all about. You know, it's not about just an apology here, accepting an apology there. Forgiveness is all about that second chance, that third chance, and that fourth chance. And this goes right back to the parable of the unforgiving servant, right? Where, you know, Peter comes to Jesus and he, we already talked about he's, he's like, how many times do I forgive my brother? Um, and Luke 17, actually, um, 3 through 4, um, says, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. So it's, again, we just, you never stop forgiving. It's endless. Um, so lastly, when we forgive others, they will begin to feel and see the start of reconciliation between you and them. Um, they will feel loved in the, mil- in the midst of their, their guilt and hatred. And, and by forgiving them, we are actually given the power to release any tension or any barrier that may stand between us and them, um, which is incredible. You know, you can tear down a whole barrier just by, you know, forgiving someone, and loving someone. So even more than that, um, the, the enemy will begin to feel closer to you now than ever before. Um, because as I said, there is great power in forgiveness. And, and by forgiving an enemy, a special bond, a special connection happens that only happens through forgiving your enemy. You, it's, it's no other connection. You can't, you can't feel it any other way. It only happens when you forgive an enemy or someone that's wronged you. And if you don't believe me, just try it. Just try forgiving someone, and you will see. You'll see. I I promise. So these are just a few general points concerning the benefit of others when we forgive. So now that we've seen the perspective of others, and we've looked at Jesus' perspective, um, the last angle I want to look at is your perspective. Um, Because I know I'd be thinking this, like, okay, well, what's in it for me? (laughs) No, you know, just like... um, you know, you want to know, like, okay, well, how does, how does forgiving my enemy help me, you know? And that's a good question. So the first point I absolutely need to hit on is the freedom you will have from internal bondage. Um, someone once said, holding a grudge is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. It's like you're killing yourself and just hoping he'll die before you do. It doesn't make any sense. Um, And it's so true. By being bitter, we're only killing ourselves. Um, We all know what that feels like, too. I I know exactly what that feels like. And we can all relate to that feeling of just holding a grudge and and just being bitter and holding on um, to that unforgiving spirit that just consumes you, you know? Um, So by letting hurt and baggage just sit and boil, um, eventually it's just going to create a bomb just waiting to go off. Um, and, and to a certain extent, um, holding on to an unforgiving spirit, uh, it, it feels like a prison. You know, it really traps you. And you feel like you just can't, you can't relax. You can't have peace when you're just, you've got something weighing you down. Um, so um, the second thing you need to remember concerning yourself is that we have been called to forgive as Christ forgave and still forgives us. Ephesians 4, 31 through 32 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God and Christ forgave you. You see, church, we have been given an overwhelming abundance of grace and forgiveness from the Lord. And we witness firsthand how wonderful and beautiful it is to be forgiven. 
So then I have to ask, how can we not grant that joy, that freedom, that peace, that love to our brothers and sisters? If we know what that feels like, if we know the joy that comes with that, because we're given, we're given it by the Lord, then why, can't, why won't we just grant it to others so they know that feeling? Um, so we have the power through forgiveness to grant others joy and freedom. Um, and that in itself is just incredible. So not only are we called to forgive as the Lord has forgiven us, but we have also been promised great rewards for forgiving our enemies, um, for forgiving those who sin against us. Um, in Luke 6, 35 through 38, um, uh, Jesus says, But love your enemies and do good, and lend expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. You see, we are given an abundance of rewards by being merciful and forgiving. And of this abundance of rewards, we're given the greatest reward of all, forgiveness. And if that doesn't encourage you to forgive, um, maybe my final point will. Um, and if nothing else from this message sticks, let this be the one thing that you never, ever forget. Ultimately, forgiveness is a matter of life or death. And yes, I mean eternal life and eternal death. I mean your salvation, my salvation. Look at what Jesus tells us. It's not me just coming up with this. Look, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. You guys, this isn't a joke. It's not something that Jesus just said jokingly. And he definitely didn't mean it lightly. He means exactly what he says. If we do not forgive others their trespasses, the Lord, our Father, will not forgive us of our trespasses. Do you see what I'm saying here? The greatest risk we face as a church is losing heaven. All because we can't let go of the bitterness and the grudge holding and the hatred that we have for our enemies. And if we continue holding fast to our bitterness and our vengeance, we won't be granted forgiveness from the Lord. And I think you know what that means. <laughs> It means us not being allowed into the kingdom of heaven. Because we all know that the kingdom of heaven is the dwelling place of forgiven people. You guys, let me just remind you who we are and whose we are. We are ambassadors for Christ, and we belong to Christ. This is my last verse I have to share with you guys. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21, Paul writes this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. This is what I'm doing right now. He entrusted to me the message of reconciliation. And so that's what I'm giving you guys. The Lord is giving it to you through me. Not, I'm not doing anything, but he's giving it to you through me. And he says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, church, not only has the Lord forgiven us, but he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we have been called to reconcile. And if you guys don't see how huge that is, like, he's entrusted us 
to deliver this message. And he's given us this ministry. We're so consumed with, you know, our own ministries or, you know, I, oh, I'm so excited about my ministry, you know, like, yeah, it's going really well, or, yeah, I'm excited to see what, what the Lord does, you know, through this ministry, and that's great and all, but why are we more concerned about that when we're not even concerned about the ministry he actually gave to us? We're not even, we need to spend more time focusing on the ministry that he gave to us and focus on ourselves, focus on our hearts, focus on forgiving our enemies like he's called us to do. He's given us this ministry. It's huge. We are ambassadors, ambassadors who are to not only participate in this ministry, but make it a priority. Make it your, your number one goal throughout your day. Because he's given it to us, this ministry of forgiveness and reconciliation. Guys, it's time. It's time for us to let go of the bitterness that holds us back from loving. It's time for us to let go of the vengeance that keeps us from forgiving. And it's time for us to leave justice in the Lord's hands and trust that he will handle sin accordingly because the Lord is the one who judges justly. And if you can't seem to forgive someone, look to the cross. And if you don't know how to forgive someone, look to the cross. And if you still can't seem to find the ability to forgive someone, just remember the power and the joy and the freedom that awaits you if you just forgive a sinner like me. Because what you will find is this. To forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. Thank you, guys.